Hi, everyone. Hey, Rose, can you hear me now? Hearing you really well. Very Hi, good. Gretchen. Hi, Alan. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Yolanda. Hi, Abby. It's just Rose. All right, guys, wave to Jeff and Gretchen who are joining us. We're all going to start with introductions in a moment, but this is just a good start. All right, Emily and Nick are coming in. Friends, I'm going to share, change screen sharing privileges so that we can all share. And okay. So Gretchen, I'm hoping that'll work because then you can directly share slides and control them without, you know, having to go through, through me at all. All right, guys, let me just start with attendance. Hey, um, Gretch, I think you are muted. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> All right, Kevin's headed in. All right, we're still waiting for Nico, Christine, Nick, Tanner. Dieter is, I'm here. Nick, hi. Thanks. I'm just looking up um, our questions on Google Slides. I was reading them over this morning. They're good, guys. I just want to share them with um, with Gretchen and Jeff at the start of this. All right, let me just change sharing privileges here. Okay, got the link. And then, hey, Kevin. All right, Jeff and Gretchen, if you guys check the chat, students are gonna lead with questions at the end of your presentations just to, because they've developed some curiosity, but sometimes I think it helps to be able to see the questions in advance to have a sense of what people are interested in or, you know, where student questions were. And friends, I'm just gonna complete attendance and let's see. All right, so Tanner, we're missing. Christine, Nico, top. Guys, because in the nature of today's class, does anybody have cell phone contacts for those friends? Top, Tanner, Nico. I think I have Nico and Tanner, so I can reach out Christine, to Christine, Yolanda, Emily, I'm assuming one of you guys has Christine. Top, I think, would be a miracle if we saw. But Tanner, if anyone has Tanner, be good to text and just say, hey, class started. For Jeff and Gretchen, we are in the last week of class. And let's just say that counting down the days is definitely part of everyone's life right now. So as I'm sure you're experiencing as parents. Like, like Believe me, I, I'm stressing right now, hoping my son is on his class. Uh, yes, I understand. I have no, I have no idea if he is. So. <laughs> I, just, I, just talked, I just came out of meeting with my advisees. I'm like, listen, everybody, finish strong, OK? And they're like, yeah, you know, I might go. I'm like, no, 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 Amelia, go to class. <laughs> So, but this is a very committed group that you're part of right now, so I think it's good. Okay, Christine, hi. All right, why don't we start with introductions. Jeff and Gretchen, if I could ask you maybe to introduce yourselves um, last, and we'll go around and start with students first. For students, I think it'd be helpful to start with your name, your um, current grade, if you're a senior, the college you're going to, and then um, what you're hoping to do, like your current career interest. And then Jeff and Gretchen, we've researched ICON to some extent, and I can, I, if you'd like to, I can share the assessment, like the assignment that I gave them to, to research ICON. We found it to be a bit of a nebulous company. Like you're, it seems to be a major support company for like the marketing and the completion and the development of drugs. But it's not like, um, for example, last week we had a visit from GSK and the the company is so tangible, like you know exactly what it's doing. You're using their toothpaste, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think yeah. it'd be helpful having like a sense of icon a little more. We did the best that we could with the stuff that we could find online. We read your profiles, each of you. Sure. We, we did our research to some extent, but just to know that there's a little gap there just because of the nature, I think, of the company's mission. Yeah. Yep. All right, Alan. So Alan's gonna start us off and then Abby, you're on deck. 
Okay, um, my name is Alan. I'm a 12th grader and I'm going to Wash U St. Louis uh, for uh, majoring in bio. Great. Hi, I'm Abby. I'm in 12th grade. I'm going to Fairfield University in Connecticut and I'm going to become a nurse. Right. Nick, oh, sorry, Nick, you can't see your next. Nick, you're up and then Kevin, you're on deck. All right, uh, my name is Nick. Um, I'm also a senior at West Town. I'm going to University of Pennsylvania next year, um, hoping to go into neuroscience. Great. I am. Kevin, you froze. Is it just Kevin, guys? No, he's frozen for me, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Nick was coming in. He looks like he's in a West Town dorm to me, though. He's, he's not. He's in Vietnam. <laughs> Right, we should say where we're all in from too. Hi, Nico. Okay, guys, let's give Kevin a minute to reconnect. Can we do Charlie, Yolanda, Emily, and Christine? So for, for Gretchen and Jeff, just to have a sense, for Charlie, Yolanda, Emily, and Christine, they're all in China at the moment. They're mostly going to be off of video because of bandwidth issues. Like they tend to, their system, their VPN tends to crash. Mm -hmm. So Abby and Nick are in Westchester. Kevin's back. He's in Hi. Vietnam right yeah. now. Nico's in Germany. And then Alan, where are you at, buddy? I can't remember if you went. I'm in Beijing. Yeah, he went home too. Okay, so yeah, Alan's in Beijing too. Okay, so, all right, so Kevin, you're up, and then, um, and then Nico, and then Charlie. Okay, so uh, I'm Kevin. I'm a junior, and I'm interested in biochemistry, and I don't know where I'm going yet for college. Go for it, Nico. Um, I'm Nico. I'm a junior too, and I'm interested in engineering all right charlie's up and then yolanda emily christine um i'm charlie and i'm a 12th grader and for college i'm going to berkeley to study comp sci great i'm yolanda i'm a junior um i want to major in biology and go on like the scientific research path Um, hi, I'm Emily. I'm a junior right now, um, and I want to major in religion in the future. Hi, I'm Christine, and uh, I'm a junior, and I want to major in, uh, in chemistry. All right, so Jeff or Gretchen, whichever one of you would want to start off with like an introduction and wherever you want to go with it. Sure. Sounds good. Um, Jeff, I, I was thinking you'd make me go first, so I'll go. <laughs> I, ladies first. <laughs> I knew you were gonna say that. Um, so my name is Gretchen Goller. Um, I am a parent of a West Town student. Uh, I have a junior there. Um, and I apologize if any of you know him and don't like him. Uh, I've did my best. Now I've turned it over to West Town. Um, his name is Jalen. He's also a junior uh, going into his senior year. Um, I am located about 25 minutes from West Town campus. Um, you guys have done your research, so I kind of feel like I don't want to tell you my background, but uh, I can give you a little bit. And, and Teacher Rose, it's totally, you can tell me how deep you want us to go. Um, but in my slides, I have a slide for me and Jeff to kind of go about our career path. So I think I'll just stop there for the basic introduction and then we'll go into more uh, in-depth stuff when the slides start. Great. So hi, everybody. I'm Jeff James. Uh, my son Henry is a 10th grader at West Town. Uh, this is his first year at West Town. Uh, and we have a daughter who's a rising junior in college. Uh, so we're all hanging out here in Wilmington, Delaware together. So we, we live about half an hour from the West Town campus. Uh, so excited to be here to talk to you guys. I guess I wanted to start by saying, uh, you know, I know this has been a really tough time. Uh, I know our son and our daughter are having their ups and downs. Uh, I know if you're a senior, this is probably not the way you wanted to finish. Um, so, uh, you know, hang in there. You're almost finished, I guess, and lots to look forward to. And for those of you who are juniors, lots to look forward to next year, hopefully. But, uh, you know, I know at our house, uh, it has its moments. So hopefully you're all hanging in there. Multiple. This is everyone's last class for this class. So oh, it's yeah. a really nice way to end it. Okay. 
no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure at all. Like you're, yeah, no, it's really good. It's really good. In fact, it's probably one of the most substantive classes of the week. If my advisors are right, like everyone's like, oh, you can work on your final. Like, <laughs> so this is one of their most, probably more substantive classes of the week. Okay. So, so teacher Rose, do you want, I mean, do you want to maybe, maybe if you could summarize, well, unless that was your summary, which is that we're nebulous. Uh, and that's okay. <laughs> no, it's not my summary. No, I had it more thoughtful more than about, that. A little bit more about what we do, if, if that's helpful. But um, is I that mean, a good I place to start? Sure. I think that's a great place to start. Anything that's helpful. Like if I can share the assignment that we kind of created to go through, if that would help at all, like what everybody, what you folks do. But yes. it's also fine to take it from the get-go, whichever is most helpful. I have the assignment loaded. Why don't, if you yeah, why don't you share with us and that'll okay. give you grounding on where to go next. All right, so I'll, I'll run through it and then I'll stop sharing so that you friends can start sharing if you wish. So, okay. So we read your profiles from LinkedIn to get a sense of educational background, although I doubt all of us have it in our mind. So I think really hearing about career path would be helpful. It's something that's just, um, I really think in the teenage years, one of my goals with visits like this is to have a sense of broadening their scope of sorry to speak about all of you in the third person, but to broaden their scope of what's possible. I really think that in the teenage years, you tend to think of life in buckets. Like I could be a teacher, I could be a lawyer, I could be a doctor, but there's really so many options in science and I want them to have a sense of that breadth and depth. We looked at your service promotional video and then um, I was like, see how I say, I'm like, Icon seems to be a company that's specializing in supporting other companies do this. That's what I'm getting a sense of. So we watched that. Um, we read the Wikipedia page and I'm comparing it to our GSK visit. I'm like with 15,000, it's smaller than GSK, but it still has a global presence, right? Yeah. I thought the coronavirus observatory was really amazing. So we looked through that just to like then just as a hub, it, I found it helpful too. just this is last, I prepped this last week. So the stats may not be accurate anymore. We looked at your increased revenue. The company seems to be thriving. Revenue has been increasing steadily. They did um, a deep dive project into companies in December where, um, or most of the students in this class did a deep dive project in companies where they each had to choose um, a scientific company and research its entire scope of the company, like major products it produces, learning the chemistry of those products, also doing um, some of the financial side to do, start looking at annual reports, just getting a sense of how a company operates. And then they, um, so I said, here I'm saying, frankly, questions will be more difficult to generate for ICON. While it has a defined mission, its goals are not as obvious and tangible as GFKs, I said, but it's important to be prepared. And I said, here it is, it's completely fine to ask questions about most challenging aspects of the job, past un this unique company, nature of clinical trials, the company's work on COVID, please try not to repeat questions. And that's, that's what we prepped, if that helps. That's really Yeah, that's great. Okay. Some of you will be, some of you will be able to be uh, analysts for uh, for the pharmaceutical industry someday then if you've done all that research it's great exactly. we want to be prepared for you you're spending our time with us we, we try to be prepared for every right. guest that comes to visit we try to prepare for them yeah so so maybe maybe i can try to describe the, the company in in a couple sentences which maybe will give you a better sense of what we do so unlike a company like uh, GlaxoSmithKline, where you've already had this conversation it sounds like with them I mean, they are a discoverer and manufacturer of pharmaceutical or biotechnology products, right? So they, they may discover those in their own labs. They may partner with other companies uh, that, that then develop ultimately a product, a medicine that you or I or someone we know may take. Icon doesn't develop anything. We don't manufacture anything on our own, but we work with lots of companies like GSK. In fact, most of the big pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies in the world we work with, and we help them to develop the products that they're trying to, to progress to approval for medicines that people can take to improve their lives. So our company uh, doesn't only work in one area like cancer research or central nervous system research or diabetes research. We work all across all of those different therapies and support pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies to help get their products to market. Those companies don't typically have large staffs of people that work in the development part of research and development. And that's where ICON's sweet spot really is. That's the work that we do is in helping once trials, once drugs or biotechnology products get into human clinical trials, 
our company helps to develop those clinical trials, helps to, to work on and manage those clinical trials to help a drug get to market. Does that make sense? Gretchen, anything you wanted to add there? You're going to say that. Um, yeah, I, I think really the easiest way to explain it is we're the arms and legs of these companies. So where our GSK focuses on their compounds and their particular um, specific drugs that they're, they're developing, we work, as Jeff said, for all of these different companies. And they come to us and say, okay, we have this compound. We want to, we want to run this clinical trial here, Icon, we need you to do that for us. So we provide people, um, we provide, I mean, from it's from the beginning to end, we can help them with protocol development. If they have a concept that they need to develop out to a full protocol, we can help them do that. Um, we, we then become sort of the middleman to implement their studies. So we're kind of the, the bodies that actually do the work. I, I, I've used, as you probably saw in my LinkedIn profile, I worked for a sponsor before, and I think that, you know, this, the work staff, as Jeff stated, is usually smaller, and they, you know, have staff doing a bunch of other things, but the actual implementation of the trials, typically they outsource to a company like Icon. So, so maybe, maybe we go to kind of how we got to where we got next. Does that, that work? So Gretchen, you... You want me to go or you want to go? That sounds great. I think that you guys should feel free to kind of kind of take the presentation to maybe like 1105, 1107, in which case I'll yeah. probably pause us for questions from students. Okay. And then um, it's going to feel unnerving. It tends to be a very respectful group. So they're going to completely wait till you're done. Okay. So it's an unnerving right. quiet, but just trust it. Okay. Well, I guess to, to me, the most important thing is for, you know, let us talk for a little bit, but then let's make sure we get some questions from you guys, because that, that's probably the most helpful thing. Yeah, I agree. Um, do we want, I don't even, do we, I wouldn't even go to the slides, or would we want to just talk about our background first and then see? Yeah, I want to, I want to zip through our backgrounds quickly. Okay. And sure, I'll be quicker than Jeff. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Jeff is business development, so he, <laughs> he, he has more to say. Um, I'm kidding. Um, so I feel like I've kind of gone through all of the levels of the drug development world in terms of everywhere I've worked. But let me start um, going from a career path for you guys, for your purposes. I actually went to a boarding school just like you guys, um, and I was not a science person. Uh, I was really interested. I was my I was interested in science, but my strengths were more in the English side of things. So um, when I went to college, undergrad, um, I actually was an English and Spanish major. Um, and like you all, you and I'm sure you all are light years ahead of me in terms of what do you want to be. Um, I really wasn't sure at the time, so I kind of went with what I was really good at, and that was writing. Um, expressing myself, um, researching, um, but I didn't go the science route. When I graduated undergrad and I moved to Pennsylvania, um, I knew one thing and that was that I wanted to continue my education. Um, so I actually took a job at the University of Pennsylvania as a research coordinator, um, purely to get my graduate degree, uh, not really to be a researcher. So I, I sort of stumbled into this career path that I knew nothing about, um, fortunately. Um, and then, so going to an academic university, uh, really like Penn and being a part of a really robust science area um, was super fortuitous for me. And so I started as a research coordinator at Penn and I was there for 10 years. And what did that entail? Initially, I was very administrative, right? I was driving around the chairman of a department. Um, so I had the fancy title, I thought, as research coordinator, but I was really doing things like picking up dry cleaning and crazy things. But during that, that experience, I also learned all about clinical research. Um, I learned about running clinical trials. I learned about speaking to patients. I learned about where drugs came from and all of these different drugs that either my family members were on or you know, people in my family or friends were taking how they came to market and how they came to be. So even though it was not a path that I knew that I wanted to be a part of, I learned so much. Um, and I spent 10 years there um, meeting patients, um, doing research, 
conducting clinical trials directly with patients, writing grants for the NIH. Um, I have so many different things that I did in those 10 years that I'm so grateful for and worked in so many different therapeutic areas. Uh, and being a part of that institution, such a strong teaching institution um, that does such a tremendous amount of research and does a really great job was really invaluable. So that career path uh, was a really great sounding board for, for coming where I am now because I learned firsthand how to consent to patient and how to talk to families about research um, and how to find patients, how to retain patients. Sometimes when we're not on this Zoom call, I can tell you my crazy stories of wandering around West Philadelphia trying to find some of my patients in my trials. But um, it was really a firsthand look at how we do research. Then from there, um, it was either move on to get my PhD or kind of jump to working in large pharma. So I chose to go into large pharma and I worked for a couple different companies uh, like AstraZeneca, uh, Wyeth, which is now Pfizer, and then Sanofi was my last stint where um, I was a patient recruitment person. Um, and I stayed at Sanofi for about five years, um, and then I came into this clinical research organization world. Um, and ICON is my second clinical research organization where, um, again, it's a very different world than working for uh, a pharmaceutical company, the sponsor company, and it's a very different world than working at an actual research site. So I kind of feel like I have the trifecta of the drug development world. And now I'll stop because I could go on forever. And I lied, Jeff, I'm talking more than you would. <laughs> it's all right, so it's funny because your background, uh, it, we didn't know, so Teacher Rose, thank you, because Gretchen and I did not know that we were both West Town parents, uh, even though we've seen each other quite a bit over the last couple of years. So uh, that was great to make a connection. Um, and my background is similar. I guess I would say a lot of you have described wanting to go down a, a, a biology or a chemistry track um, is a little different probably from, from the way Gretchen and I both got into the pharmaceutical industry, but it tells you a bit about, uh, I think as you said, Teacher Rose, the, you know, the, there isn't one defined career path that's, that's very black and white or very linear in my mind. So uh, when I got out of college, I covered the Baltimore Orioles, a uh, professional baseball team here in America for a year. Uh, and I worked for a publishing company in New York. Uh, and then I joined a management consulting company because people told me that I looked good in a suit uh, and that I was a good problem solver. Those are the main criteria for being a management consultant, I was told at least. So, uh, and that consulting firm was working in the pharmaceutical industry. And that's how I learned a lot about what happens in the, in the research and the development part of getting drugs to, to patients. I've worked at a couple of pharma companies and biotech companies. I worked at AstraZeneca like Gretchen. Uh, that's how I got here to Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and I worked at Amgen, a biotechnology company in California. Maybe my coolest experience working in this industry was touring the labs there where they, they actually grow uh, the products that they, are, that they put to market eventually. Uh, so they have a product called Epigen, which is a a, a drug that boosts your red blood cell production uh, and they actually make it there on the campus. And it was really cool to see how that worked in the lab. Uh, so here at ICON, my job is to help uh, develop partnerships with other pharmaceutical companies. So we work with a lot of the big pharmaceutical and biotech companies in the world, as I said, and, and typically we do a lot of the clinical trial work that those companies do. So my background is mainly in business and management, um, but I've learned, I guess I would say enough about all these different technical aspects of the pharmaceutical industry uh, to be dangerous enough to help manage things. So, so the, the path again is, is, is I think maybe important for you guys to hear just because you're a chemistry major or a biology major or uh, you wanna go into religion, you might find yourself working in lots of different things in life uh, because of certain skills that you have. Uh, and you know, I would say for me to get up every day, especially in the COVID-19 world, uh, where we are helping companies develop vaccines and therapeutics uh, that'll hopefully get us all back to congregating together at West Town or wherever it is you're going to college, uh, you know, that's very inspiring. If you can't get up uh, out of bed and do what we do all day, I'm not, I'm not sure what you can get out of bed. So 
So I think Gretchen, maybe let's, we, we we're gonna talk to you guys a little bit about kind of how drugs get to market, if that's interesting to you. Um, so do you wanna, maybe we'll just kind of whip through a couple of the slides and keep an eye on the time? They, may, they might already know, Jeff, I don't know, I'm a little intimidated. They probably know the whole drug development process um, and these slides they're gonna mock. So um, <laughs> yeah, let me, um, let me try to do this. With That's your Zoom, your Zoom capabilities here. Not, they're not good. Um, and Gretchen, you see the share screen. Oh, you're doing great. There, got it. You got it? You got it, we can see it. Uh, okay, I'm trying to make it bigger. Again, I, I was saying when I was on mute that this is not our platform at work. So my Zoom is because of whatever you guys, uh, <laughs> whatever we've learned at being West Town parents. Um, so you just wanna to go to present, and then after you go to present, you wanna share again to that screen. Uh, oh, attract with you, you. perfect, attract you. Did. you did. good? Excellent, okay. Um, so really, uh, sorry, I had to throw in memes because you know we're doc talking to teenagers. So if you're like, don't think it's funny, that's fine. Um, let me close these. So yes, um, what I can say is that uh, we in the past, I don't know, Jeff, three months, four months, um, it's been a little easier to explain what we do. I'll tell you that because um, I think when we are talking to people as we're you know, in the elevator uh, and they ask you what you do, I think people don't have a really good sense, most folks, about what clinical research is. So um, this is kind of, what we talk about all day long are clinical research, clinical trials. And for me, I'm a patient recruitment person. So my job is to find patients for our studies. So um, these are our, our jokey memes when you guys have much cooler ones. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is too, uh, you know, much of a question for people to ask, um, but you can talk about a family member, but can anyone give me a drug either over the counter or prescription that you're taking or a family member is currently taking? Um, Humira B1. Perfect, 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 perfect. So any guesses, Jeff, why don't you Google this real quick? <laughs> <laughs> but any guesses how long that drug took to develop? You can 15 say. years. That's actually really close. I don't know the exact amount for Humira, but on average, the drug development process can take up to, I think the average lately has been 10 years. Um, so really introducing a new drug to market is, has been for decades, a very complex and time consuming process that can take up to 10 years to develop a, a new drug. And it can cost pharmaceutical companies on average $2.6 billion. Um, so if you think about that, just one drug taking 10 years to develop, costing that much, um, it's kind of amazing. If you look, um, just looking at this outline, when you're talking to folks and they're looking at their different compounds and trying to figure out what compound they want to test to bring to the next stage, 10,000 compounds can actually lead, if you follow the funnel, to one. So it's pretty amazing that the drugs that we currently have, um, either over the counter or via prescription, have, have all gone through this process. So when I used to talk to patients um, explaining what clinical research was, I would go over their list of medications and I would say, every medication that you take, either that you buy at a drugstore or that you get a prescription for from your physician had to go through this process. So it's incredibly important, um, you know, not to sort of puff ourselves up, but what we do, I think, is extremely important to bring new medicines and vaccines to, to our world. And if you can see how long this takes, it's pretty amazing um, that, especially in the current climate, how things are moving so fast, but typically, you know, this is sort of the funnel of what that looks like going from the compound stage all the way to regulatory approval and how many compounds it takes to actually find one that works in humans that is worthy uh, of the investment. I'm going to move on. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to. 
Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I'll just talk a little bit about how, how companies kind of come from basic research they're doing into products that they ultimately want to test in humans. So all drug development starts in what, what we call preclinical. This is where bench scientists, they could be biologists in big biotech companies, or they could be chemists uh, and other folks with, with uh, science degrees who are working in labs, uh, like these people are shown here doing. Uh, and they're, they're looking for drugs that might work uh, in certain kinds of, of settings, certain indications for diseases that people have. And they do, they do in vitro and in vivo tests, meaning they're doing some testing in animals and they're also doing it not in anything, but just in in vitro systems like yeasts or bacterias. And ultimately they're then coming to their management and saying, okay, we found this product that we think might cure cancer. Uh, whether that's colon cancer, or breast cancer, or head and neck cancer. They then will go off and test that in animals uh, that typically have similar body systems to, to humans. Um, and those tests then tell us a bit about what happens to those products when they're put into, into animals or humans. Tells us a bit about how the drugs are digested, how they're metabolized, how they're secreted, uh, how, you, how, how long they stay in your body. These are all the sort of principles of pharmaco pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. And then whether the, the product itself is tolerated uh, by those animals uh, in terms of, of toxicology studies. So if you go to the next one, so, so once then a product is seen, and maybe a good example for you all is there, there are lots and lots of stories of cancer being cured in rats. Um, but in order to jump to the conclusion that, well, that's going to work in humans is, is not one that we can take. So then we have to start doing testing in humans. And the first thing that we do is very small clinical trials. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but as Rachel said, uh, sorry, as Gretchen said before, you know, it takes about, uh, you know, one in a thousand of those different tests. And as you all know, as, as chemistry students, you're conducting experiments all the time. And part of the beauty of science is uh, a failed experiment is not a failed experiment. It's a lesson on how you, how you can improve whatever you're doing. So if you go to the next one, Gretchen, so, so then we go through these different phases, they call them of clinical trials in humans. The first one being very limited exposure to people who are healthy. Uh, and all we're trying to test in those kinds of clinical trials is, is the drug safe to give to people? So those are typically done in very controlled settings where uh, we make sure the patients are generally safe and we're trying to figure out whether the drug can be tolerated by humans. Uh, and, and again, they're, they're typically very small. From there, assuming the drug is safe, we start to test them in humans and figure out whether they're both safe and they have some effect, some positive effect on the, on the disease that we're trying to cure. Uh, and we're trying to also determine what is the right dose. Is it five milligrams? Is it 10 milligrams? Is it 50 milligrams? Is it once a day? Is it twice a day? Those kinds of things. And then the next one, I think. Uh, so then this is just sort of an infographic on all those different kinds of tests. We then go uh, there in the orange to what's called phase three testing. That's the largest uh, scale testing that we do before a drug can be. Uh, submitted for approval to a regulatory agency. And in those kinds of studies, we're looking at the, the safety again and the effect of the drug. Does it work? Does it decrease tumor size? Does it help you with your asthma, whatever the disease is? Uh, and then making sure as well that longer term, the drug can be tolerated for as long as patients need to take it. We then go into an approval where government regulators say yes or no to products. And then the final phase, that sort of phase four, is a little bit about, um, again, safety, as well as uh, some great stories of drugs that help people with uh, 
maybe asthma, but they also help to grow hair on the top of your head or so. You can continue testing drugs because they might be effective in more than one area. So those are the, those are the big stages of, of clinical trial work. So, so I wonder, I, I guess, Teacher Rose, I wondered, you know, do we want to go at this point to some questions? Does that work for timing? What do you think, team? Do people have questions that are sitting with them? You guys all prepared wonderful questions. I'm happy to <laughs> encourage somebody to ask one, but you guys usually don't need that much encouragement. Does somebody want to lead off? Kevin, thanks. I just want to ask that like you describe the safety test, who will be the subjects of the safety test that lasted for a, for a few weeks to test if the drugs are safe on humans? Yeah, who will be that's a good subjects? question. So typically uh, those are, again, healthy people, uh, 18 and older. So they could be some of you um, and you may have, when you're riding around in your car here in America, you may may hear advertisements for, you know, would you like to be a participant in a clinical trial? So, so Kevin, those those people are people from the general population. Uh, those tests are typically conducted perhaps in one center. So it could be at the University of Pennsylvania or it could be at a hospital site. Uh, and you might recruit 30 hum healthy humans and you might give them a drug, hold them for a few days in a, in a hospital-like setting, uh, and they're doing some testing, you know, they're, they're doing blood draws and looking at uh, how the drug is, is metabolized and how it's excreted and, uh, and also making sure that those patients are safe. So typically those studies are, are very safe um, and it's because they're done in a very controlled setting, but they, they don't typically outside of cancer research, they're not done and people have the disease you're trying to cure yet. Um, the, I guess the one, one thing I would say that's different is in, is in cancer research, we don't typically do healthy volunteer research because it's not ethical. Um, if you have cancer, uh, typically you wanna be taking something already and so those are typically done in, in patients. Does that help? Yeah. Um, what about if the drugs turn out to be fatal to humans? Like, what would they do then? Did you say fail or fatal? Fa fatal. Fatal. Like, yeah. So there, yeah. there is one. There is one example. Oh, ten or twelve years ago, of a clinical trial that was being conducted in in England and the UK. Um, where several of the healthy volunteers unfortunately died. Um, and that is extremely rare. I cannot think of another example in the last 25 years where that was the case. And, and Kevin, I would say it doesn't typically happen, again, because the setting in which those trials are conducted uh, has to be such that the patient, the, the healthy volunteers that are in the trial are very close to a hospital uh, if they're not already in a hospital and therefore they can get urgent and emergency care should, should their health condition uh, you know, deteriorate in a rapid way. So it's very, very uncommon, but it did happen with a, a company uh, like ours that was developed, that was working on a drug for a pharmaceutical company uh, and what happened at the end was there were further country and regional regulations put in place to keep the, the healthy volunteers safe. Thank you. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Other questions? I guess one question that I have, oh, sorry, Abby. You, can, you go, Nick, it's okay. okay. Um, one question that I have, um, especially during this time with the pandemic, is um, is ICOM partnering with any companies right now to um, 
in terms of vaccines and how 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 is ICON dealing with speeding up the process for clinical trials? Because I know it can take a really long time, but for this specific um, virus, it's really important to try to speed up the time um, in development. Yeah. Yeah, so we, I don't know, Gretchen, I'll let you jump in in a second, but I have a cool story that I know uh, E.B. and I were involved in. So Gretchen's boss, um, is he your boss? Is yeah. E.B. your boss? Okay, yeah. there we go. <laughs> um, uh, so, so Nick, it's a great question. And what I would say has been really inspiring is, you know, the clinical trial process takes a long time and it's, it, it takes a long time because of all the safety that we are all concerned about. Um, and I wouldn't say corners are being cut here, but I w what I will say is I have seen pharmaceutical companies, companies like ICON, regulators, government entities, and clinical trial sites, doctors who, who are performing the clinical trials on patients really move really quickly in, in reaction to COVID-19. So things that used to take months uh, are now taking days, which is really, really inspiring to see. Uh, that's just a really quick story. We're working with a, with a company in New York called Regeneron, which are, you all may have heard of, um, because they are doing some COVID-19 research. And they were looking for, uh, for nurses to go to a hospital in New York to help run a clinical trial that they were doing. And they called us on a Saturday, um, Gretchen's boss and I, and said, do you have any of these people uh, that might be interested in helping us? We have all these COVID-19 patients, but we can't get them in the trial fast enough. So Gretchen's boss made about five phone calls and in about an hour he had, was actually holding people back because they were saying, just let me find somebody to watch my dog and I will get in my car now and drive to New York to help these people. From North so Carolina. Yeah, so that was really inspiring. Uh, and we are working with a bunch of different companies on both therapeutics and vaccines. Uh, and some of the things that are going on, Nick, are, are, are really interesting. You probably have read some things about maybe some results of vaccine trials being available and maybe even some doses of, of vaccine ready in the fall. That, that would be absolutely uh, groundbreaking in terms of the time it takes to get there. Um, and interestingly, one of the tricks when you're doing vaccine work is you have to give it, you have to give a vaccine to people you think are going to get what it is you're trying to, to vaccinate them against. So a lot of the work that we're doing is chasing this vaccine to the right places where the outbreaks are the most prevalent. Uh, and then also looking at, uh, sort of populations of people who might be most susceptible to getting it like healthcare workers. And just one comment to add to Jeff's, I think what we're seeing, and Jeff and I've been doing this a long time, him much longer than me, of course, but what we're seeing is unbelievable timelines being met that really is just a testament to all these different groups being working together and being motivated, like the story of some of our folks driving from North Carolina to New York to help out. Everybody is just working together and trying to remove the, the barriers that typically do take years to bring these drugs to market. So he's right. If we can have a therapeutic or a vaccine by the fall or even by the end of the year, it will be unlike anything we've ever accomplished in our industry uh, since the beginning. So it's really an exciting time beyond everybody finally figuring out what Jeff and I do. Um, it's really an exciting time for all of you to, to witness uh, how fast we're moving and, and more importantly, how we're all working together um, to, to make it happen. And as he said, no corners are being cut. It's really just everybody being vested and doing everything they can from driving all the way from North Carolina to New York uh, in PPE, you know, when they get there to ensure that these patients are dosed. Friends, I think we probably have time for one more question. I'm going to invite everyone to stay for a few more minutes, if time allows, for you and Jeff, for Jeff and Gretchen as well. Like 11.15 is our normal close, but I'm going to invite everyone to stay for a few more minutes. Does anyone have a pressing question? And if not, Yolanda, I thought your second question kind of spoke to me a little bit. So if you'd like to ask that one. Years ago, I brought this class, not specifically you guys, but this class down to DuPont for several hours so they could have a sense of the day there a bit. And I think that one of the things that students really reflected on on the way back 
besides like Rose, can we stop at Wawa was like that the day surprised them. They didn't think there were, you know, they, their days as teenagers in school are so different than the days that they would spend at a pharmaceutical company all day, like what the day would feel like. And so I thought it might be, Yolanda, do you want to ask your question? And in light of that, like, do you want to ask it? Yeah, I think my question was about like, what is a typical day for like an employee or for you two um, to be working at Icon? Like, what is the typical day be like? Yeah, I mean, Jeff had a really good day when he talked about that Saturday, but I'll, I'll quickly answer and I'm sure his days are more interesting than mine, but really it's, it's, I would say the biggest takeaway is no day is exactly like the day before um, because he and I, I mean, this is pre COVID he travels a lot and he'll tell you about that, but we are really, we're, we're a, um, an Irish um, owned company. So our front, our beginning days in this time zone are, are really heavily front loaded. So we're in meetings from 7 a.m. to often the evening. And, you know, while that might sound very unexciting sitting at home being, you know, with headsets and listening to meetings all day, the meetings jump from topic to topic and it's pretty interesting. Um, you can be, for my day, I can be talking about patients and what their families would need and what they would need to be in, enrolled in a trial um, to talking to a GSK or a Regeneron about what their protocol consists of and what it's needed to talking about financial situations in our company. Um, it's a huge variety. I mean, we, it, does, it sounds super boring as a teenager to be in meetings all day, right? But um, you know, what I can say is that it's super interesting. Every topic is different and you know, your, your audience changes constantly. It could be a team meeting where we're trying to you know, get everybody uh, engaged and kind of excited about something, or then we're presenting to a, a GSK about what we wanna do for them. So, um, but Jeff can tell you a more exciting day because uh, pre-COVID, you know, he was, he's going all over the world talking to different clients uh, about what we do. Yeah, I, I think it is hard to describe a typical day. I, mean, I guess keep in mind Gretchen and I are, are in management. And so a lot of what managers do is help run a business uh, and, and solve problems. I guess, again, I, I would say if I had to divide my day up, I would say 60 to 70% of my day is spent solving problems. That might be helping solve a problem with somebody that works with me or for me, or it might be helping a pharmaceutical company figure out the answer to a problem that will help them get a medicine moving faster down the development track. Uh, so some of that problem solving can, can be very exciting because there is always a challenge in what we're doing. I guess I would say it this way, you know, we don't, if I compare it to, we don't manufacture sneakers at Icon, right? So if, you, if we worked at Nike and we manufactured sneakers, we would be trying to perfect the fastest way to get the sneaker down the production line so that it could get out the door and on your foot. Uh, what we do is we work with human beings in clinical trials, patients who are sick and need medicines. And because that human factor is involved and because developing drugs is highly regulated, meaning there are lots of rules that we have to follow, uh, it is complicated to navigate and there's no one clinical trial that runs exactly like another. And so if you like to solve problems and you like to work with people uh, and you like to try to help improve people's lives, working in the pharmaceutical industry can be exciting even though the problems can be a little mundane day to day sometimes. But, uh, but there's lots of opportunity to feel part of something that's, that's really inspiring. And I hope I leave you, with you guys with that. It is, um, Unfortunately, people will continue to get sick. We will all get older and we all need medicines to live a better life. Uh, and that's kind of what ICON's about. And it's, it's sort of the career path that Gretchen and I have been on. All right, any final pressing thoughts team? I know Abby had a question that she didn't get to answer. Sorry, Abby, to call you out, but. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. I was just um, going to say my dad, he works with um, AstraZeneca sometimes. I remember you mentioning that, but um, yeah, it's all good. I was just wondering, like, if there are any products um, or if there are any um, specific products that um, 
you'd like to talk about with AstraZeneca? Because from what my dad's told me about it, it seems like a pretty cool, um, pretty cool company. So yeah. Yeah. So I worked at AstraZeneca for, for eight years. I spent those eight years every six weeks flying to, to England, uh, Manchester in the UK and, and to Sweden where we had research and development facilities. Um, here in Wilmington, which is about 20 minutes, 25 minutes from, from Westchester, they discovered a drug called Seroquel, which um, is a drug that's for schizophrenia and people who have depression, major depression. Um, and those kinds of products are very difficult to develop um, because uh, central nervous system drugs typically have a very high failure rate. So uh, I worked in the lab in one of the big laboratory buildings here in Wilmington when I worked at AstraZeneca. Uh, it was very cool to pass all the scientists who are working on things and see how excited they can get about something. So that's a great one, uh, and AstraZeneca is really, I would say, Abby in the process of transforming themselves into a, a, a company that's focused on cancer research, like many companies are, because that's certainly a big area of medical need. Um, but there's lots of great products that they've put on the market over the years um, that, that I think they, they and other companies can be very proud of. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for the great questions. Yeah, so absolutely. guys, can we just express our thanks in any way? If you are off video, if you could just do, you know, ways to express thanks that way. And then if you're on video, maybe we just wave and just say thank you so much for your time. We recognize like with the demands of parenting. Oh, Emily, thank you. Thanks, Charlie. We recognize with the demands of parenting and work remotely that we un definitely understand. I have a two and a four year old downstairs. So I definitely, <laughs> definitely understand the challenges. So thank you for your time. We really do appreciate it. And I think it really, um, it was one of our goals for the course and in distance learning, I wasn't sure we could achieve it, but in some ways Zoom almost makes it easier to achieve this goal. Absolutely. Great, well, good luck to all of you. And yeah. for chemical bonding, if you could just stay for one moment after Jeff and Gretchen depart, just so I can say goodbye, so we can say goodbye to our seniors. Thank you both right. so Bye. much. Bye. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks. Seniors, I just need to say it has been a total pleasure for everyone else that I'm going to see in the fall. I just can't wait for everyone that stayed dedicated in this class. And I think you all did for the through difficult work through the spring. I just want you to know I really recognize that. I think all the way back to the fall, just at the start of this with like watching me do acid based demonstrations and just wishing it would all stop to all the way through molecular orbital theory. I just, I really appreciate each one of you and your dedication to this course. And I just didn't want the course to end without me saying that. It has been by far the highlight of my distance learning experience teaching you. Just thank you for questions, for caring, for watching me draw orbital diagrams and still going with it. Just thank you. And for the seniors, best wishes become everything I know you're going to be. And one day you'll come back to my class and talk about what you do. And I want to say this is my favorite group of people. So it is a great group. That in there. <laughs> Especially after Nico and Emily joined, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. All right. But anyway, true deep thanks. And um, I'm here if you, I'm here until I teach nuclear chem at 1130. So if anyone has questions, feel free to stay. But otherwise, have a wonderful summer. Enjoy the well-deserved break and good luck in the fall, whether you're at West Town, whether you're at college or Nico, wherever Nico is going to be. <laughs> All right. Bye and virtual hugs to everybody. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Teacher Rose. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, too. You. Bye, Have guys. a nice summer. You Bye. too. Take care. Bye. Teacher Rose, I was just Thank wondering uh, for the final. Yeah. Um, How's that going? It, no, it's, go it's going well. I was just run wondering if uh, you may, I don't know, I, I tr tried it several, not, yeah, several times. And there are some questions like, because uh, um, I mean, I drew NH3 as a Lewis structure and obviously has one lone pair of electrons, right? Yeah, sounds right. Did I mess up? I could have messed up, Nico, yeah. definitely. Could you just like check? Uh, the, Can you tell me the question please? number? Well, I don't know. And it's also another one. Um, to be oh, honest, no. Did I, I not I, number I, the questions? Oh, Nico, let's hope I numbered the questions. Sometimes you, I don't know. No, you did. You did. I just. Uh, okay, well, there's like 25 questions, don't... buddy, so you got to help me out. Yeah, wait, wait, wait a second. Then quiz here. There's final assessment. Uh, it's question number first for I think for question number 13 I, I actually tried all of the answers and none of them was right <laughs> for 13 okay looking at that one yeah. first 
the greatest number of oxidation states. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I looked at it. It's E for um, oh, nitrogen. Did. Okay, okay, all right. Because I, I like say. nitrogen has the most possible oxidation states. Yeah, yeah. And I'm pretty, I don't know if you, I didn't take it. I, I took it, I think on Monday, maybe you, you, you did it already, but for 18, the, the Lewis structure of which of the following molecules shows only one lone pair of valence electrons. Oh, I think I screwed this one up. Okay, that, that it should, should be, be NH3, NH3 I and I put, yeah. oh yeah, okay. Um, I, I don't know, I was just wondering. Uh, okay. I, I was pretty sure that that should be right. Yeah, that's definitely right. Okay, so here's the thing, Nico. Canvas does not like this. It does not like when you change answers and it sometimes it doesn't update even though it's meant to. So I'm That's updating it. the question twice and I'm saving it and it should have been NH3. I'm sorry, Nico, that was a mistake on my That's part. Okay. But there's a guarantee that I mess up each time no matter what I, how many times I read through it. Okay, I definitely changed it. It should read for NH3 for the correct answer now. Yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you, teacher Rose. Bye-bye. Anytime, bye. my friend. It it's been nice a pleasure this year, Nico. Visit bye again bye. one day. Bye. Yeah, I will. Bye. Bye.